Hello again, everybody. Paul Rabelais here, estate planning attorney, founder of a national estate planning law firm called America's Estate Planning Law Firm, or America's Estate Planning Lawyers. More uh, information on that in the description below. So let's jump right in. Got a lot to cover. Um, been doing these live streams on various topics. Tonight's topic is whether to leave an inheritance outright or over time, balancing generosity and financial security. So a couple of the ground rules. If you've got some questions, we really love to see your comments, love to have you share some experiences. Everybody can learn from that. So that's the whole purpose of doing a live stream here is that you can participate. We can get kind of a community involved, get involved with the chat. I'm going to present some information and then I'm going to go to the chat. We'll go to the questions and comments and uh, address each one. So let's jump right in. I wanted to divide this presentation into and really into four parts. Um, what does outright versus overtime mean? That's number one. Number two is what's the different options that you have? Number three is the factors and the family dynamics that might affect your decision on whether to leave things outright versus overtime. And then fourth, I want to give you just a common sense, typical family in America case study where they have a few concerns and uh, what they did in their estate planning to address all of those concerns and make sure things stayed in the family for years, if not generations to come. So quick hey to Larry. Larry's our uh, most valuable guy here. Um, always great to see Larry on the call. Always feel more comfortable knowing Larry's on the call. Hey, Les Lakey and hey, Stephen Hines. Come back to the chat after the after the presentation. Okay, so number, no, number one of four parts, what does outright mean versus what does over time mean? Over time is really a it's you know a saying that I came up with, but let's just jump right into it. Out when you when you leave an inheritance outright, it's it's really what it sounds like. You you leave uh, you know one third of your estate to each of your children. Your estate's worth three million dollars or whatever it is. Um, each child's going to get a million dollars, and they're going to get it. It's going to be given to them. You could call it uh, dumped in their lap. You could call it they can do whatever they want to when they get it. But it's uh, somebody dies and, and then so-and-so in, uh, inheritance inherits their inheritance outright in a lump sum, no restrictions whatsoever. So that's what the outright is. And, and, and in many cases, that's, that's the way to do it. And so oftentimes people inherit different kinds of assets outright. Sometimes it's somebody gets a check. Sometimes it's inheriting stock. Sometimes it's real estate that people are inheriting outright, or maybe even an interest in a business is being inherited out, outright. So many different types of assets can be inherited outright. Now let's go into what does over time mean? Receiving an inheritance over time, in my view, is the same thing as receiving it in a trust. But over time, people can understand more so than receiving an inheritance in trust. So maybe an example is instead of someone leaving an inheritance to Robert, they leave an inheritance to what I'll call the Robert Trust. And in that trust, there is a trustee named. And in that trust instrument, it says what distributions are permitted to Robert over the during the term of the trust. And it also says when that trust ends and when perhaps Robert uh, receives the remaining trust assets at the termination of the trust. So um, so we talked about outright to Robert, he gets a check, he gets assets, he can do whatever he wants to with them or leaving assets to the Robert trust. Probably someone other than Robert is the trustee and the trust instrument defines, you know, when Robert can get distributions and when, if at all, he can receive the remaining trust assets. So leaving assets in a trust that's used for a variety of reasons, um, almost 100% of the time. Um, when assets are going to be left to a minor, it's it's always best to leave it in trust for the minor because if you leave assets to a uh, directly to a minor, a minor doesn't have the capacity to inherit. So now more court proceedings are necessary to have a guardian established. A judge oversees how how that those assets are handled until the child reach, until the minor reaches the age of majority and then this guardianship ends and the minor gets it all dumped into his, his lap typically on their 18th birthday so you always want to leave a minor's uh, inheritance in a trust you also want to leave and trust the inheritance of someone who just 
is not good at handling money, at least consider leaving it in trust. So maybe, um, you know, sometimes parents say, well, my children, you know, they're, they're good with, with their money and they make good decisions, but I just, I just don't want to give them the opportunity to blow it like they might if we just give it to them in one big chunk. So sometimes trusts are used just to make sure that the inheritance lasts over the, perhaps over the child's lifetime and they can benefit from it for the rest of their lives. Sometimes things are left in trust as opposed to outright to protect the, that inheritance from the potential future divorces of the children or of the per people who are receiving an inheritance. Sometimes things are left in trust because a beneficiary or an heir may have lots of debt, may have creditor problems. If you just dump a million dollars into their lap, their creditors is gonna, their creditors are going to uh, snap that right up. So you can leave things into a trust in particular, a spendthrift trust is the terminology that we use, that now those trust assets are protected from the creditors of that beneficiary of that trust. So a lot of different reasons people set up trust to make sure an inheritance is doled out over time. Okay, so now if, if you've got a few options, either outright or in trust slash over time, you've got some different options on how, the, how you do it and how you provide for those distributions. So let's start first with kind of the simple one, the outright distribution. There's really two ways to leave an outright distribution. The kind of simple way is, yeah, I leave everything to my three kids. I pass away. I have $3 million. Um, each child gets a check for a million dollars. They The check is payable to them. They do what they want to with it. That's, that's about as simple as an outright bequest as we can get. But in my view, there's a there's another kind of outright. And by outright, I'm really saying you're not put any any restrictions on the people who are entitled to receive the inheritance. So there's another form of outright other than just a person getting a check for a million dollars, because the potential problem is that person who's married inherits a million dollars. The moment they get it, it's their property only but perhaps they commingle or mix up that inherited money with other money that they have with a spouse. Later they get divorced, they lose half of their inheritance. So some people still like the, the idea of leaving assets outright to a child because, they, because they're okay with the child controlling the inheritance. Um, they, they know that their child has good financial responsibility but they want to protect it from that child's future divorces. So they leave it to the child's, what I call inheritance trust. Maybe the child is the trustee of their own inheritance trust. And maybe the child is not restricted from gaining access to those assets. However, that million dollars then goes into the Robert inheritance trust. And that million dollars remains in accounts titled in the name of the Robert Inheritance Trust. It's far less likely for those trust assets to get mixed up or commingled with other assets Robert may have with his spouse. So if he does get divorced, he keeps his trust. He and his spouse split the other assets they, that they've acquired during the marriage. So to me, the leaving assets to a child's inheritance trust, particularly when they are, the own, they are their own trustee, is another form of outright, just an extra layer of protection to protect it from that child's potential divorces. Next, we're gonna go through, as we talk about the different options of how you can leave things to people over time or how you can leave it in trust for them. Typically what we see is, um, let's say, instead of leaving a million dollars to Robert outright, you leave a million dollars in trust for Robert. Typically what we say is, Robert is entitled to all of the income that, that those trust assets produce as long as that trust is in existence. So let's say a million dollars when when dad dies, a million dollars goes into the Robert trust and that trust produces some, some interest, some dividends, perhaps even some rental income if the inheritance is rental property. I'm not talking about capital appreciation. I'm not talking about investing the million dollars in Apple stock and Apple stock doubles in value over the next couple of years. I'm talking about income. And, and typically what we say is the, is the beneficiary is entitled to receive the income from that trust. So if that million dollars produces $15,000, $25,000 of income in a year, that's distributed to Robert. We usually do that for income tax purposes because now Robert can receive that income and he can pay income tax 
include that as ordinary income or taxable income to Robert, as opposed to having that income accumulate in the trust and having the trust pay uh, income tax at higher trust income tax rates. Perhaps if Robert gets that $25,000 income distribution in a year, maybe he'll pay income tax at 15 or 20%. But if the trust accumulated that trust income, perhaps it would pay trust income tax at the higher, perhaps 40% trust income tax rate. So typically it's it's not uncommon for beneficiaries of the trust to, to be that income beneficiary who's entitled to the income. And then we also, before we get into some of the ages and stages and, and all of these other things uh, as to when the beneficiary can get the principle of the trust, many, many trusts say, not only does Robert or not only does, does the beneficiary, not only are they entitled to all of the income that the trust produces, but many trusts say that also, if the trustee determines that Robert needs principal distributions for Robert's health education, maintenance, and support, tip known typically as the HEM standard, H-E-M-S, if, if the trustee determines that Robert needs, uh, in addition to the income, if he needs principal for his health, health education, maintenance, and support, then the trustee is authorized to distribute principal to Robert even prior to these termination dates that I'm about to talk to. So Robert is 17 years old. He inherits a million dollars in a trust. He starts getting the income from that trust. But Robert has uh, $40,000 of tuition payments that he has to make in college. So the trustee has that discretion to distribute principal to or for Robert for those additional health, education, maintenance, and support needs that Robert may have. Now, with all that being said, Robert gets the income. Robert is entitled to principal distributions at the trustee's discretion for Robert's health, education, maintenance, and support. Now, when could Robert be entitled to additional distributions or all of the principal? We talked about Robert getting a million dollars. He gets the income, maybe $20,000 in a year. If he's in school and tuition costs and living costs are high, he'll get additional distributions of principal, perhaps at the trustee's discretion. Now, when does when does Robert get the million bucks or whatever is left of it? When does he get that principal? Well, you can set that up in many different phases. So the easiest way to uh, the easiest way to understand is when Robert reaches a certain age. So maybe grandparents say, "I leave, you know, I leave two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to Robert, my grandson, in a trust." Um, Robert's father, my child, is the trustee of that trust. Robert gets the income uh, distributions to Robert under the HEM standard. But when Robert reaches the age of 25, whatever is left in there, the trust ends and Robert gets that distribution then. So um, sometimes you see it based on an age. I would say 25 is a common age, particularly when parents with minor children are setting this stuff up. Sometimes if a child has exhibited some maybe less than really prudent financial behavior, sometimes you'll see parents or grandparents say, nope, I don't want them getting their hands on all of what's left until they're 30 or 40 or 50 or even we've even said, seen some people um, uh, express a desire so that no principal gets distributed or, or the remaining principal doesn't get distributed to, until perhaps a beneficiary is 60 years old. So you have that option, age is one. Another way to do it, and a lot of people take advantage of this, is to provide that the, that the beneficiary will receive a portion of the principal at different stages. So maybe grandparents or parents might say, you know, yeah, if we pass away, our assets go in trust for our children, used for their needs. But when they're 25, they get a third of it. When they're 30, they get a half of what's left. And when they're 35, they get the rest of it. Could be 30, 40, and 50. Could be 45, 55, and 65. There's no limit on how you can do this. Did one yesterday where they wanted it in four stages. The, the parents wanted the children to be able to kind of get their feet uh, out from under them before they started receiving the inheritance. So they provided it would be in four stages at 35, 40, 45, and 50 is when their children would, would receive the principal. So stages is one of those options. Another way to do it, this is common when perhaps a child really is poor at handling money, or perhaps they've even had some substance abuse uh, problems. And you feel like, boy, if we put in here that they get it when they're 40, there, there's no telling how they're going to turn out when they're 40. That might be the worst thing that we could do is 
let them receive their trust when they're 40. So what some people do in the right circumstances is say, well, let's let Robert's trust last for the rest of Robert's lifetime. So it it lasts for Robert's lifetime. Robert is never entitled to all of a distribution of all of the principal from the trust. Perhaps again, the trustee has that authorization to make distributions to Robert for his health education, maintenance and support, but that trust might last for his lifetime. A similar and related way to do it is to set it up where the trustee has the complete discretion to determine uh, when to terminate that trust and provide that the beneficiary gets all of the principles. So someone might say, I'm leaving Robert a million dollars. I'm leaving it in trust. I'm naming Sally as the trustee. Maybe Robert has had some substance abuse problems. And the person who's setting this up is, is saying, uh, I'm going to leave it up to Sally. I trust Sally. Sally's going to do exactly what's Robert's in best interest. So I'm going to set this trust up, up for Robert named Sally as the trustee and allow the trustee to have the discretion to determine when Robert's trust ends and when Sally turns it all over to Robert. Maybe maybe Robert cleans himself up for 10 years and he, and he does some really good things. He's got a good job. He's really good at managing money. We'll let Sally exercise her discretion to determine when it's right to uh, terminate that trust and transfer the assets over to Robert instead of putting certain age requirements on there. Another way to do it, did this for people a couple of days ago, was they felt like um, they what was right for them was they were leaving things to a particular beneficiary and they wanted that beneficiary to get a, a monthly check, for lack of a better term, out of the inheritance whenever the parents passed away. So in their set of circumstances, um, they kind of felt like $3,000 a month out of that child's share was what that child was was going to get. They didn't, they didn't want the trustee to have all of the discretion for a couple of reasons. The, the child who's the beneficiary of the trust may badger that trustee into exercising their discretion. And they didn't want the trustee having too much power to be able to withhold distributions to the beneficiary. So they felt like, yeah, I want to make sure that child of mine gets $3,000 a month. Perhaps if the child needs more, the trustee could make additional distributions under the HIM standard. But we like that automatically $3,000 would go to that beneficiary until, until that inheritance runs out. So now when you say, I want my child to get $3,000 a month, there's three different ways to leave your child Three to three thousand dollars a month. It's set it up so that when you pass away, or when you and your spouse pass away, that child share goes into a trust. Trustee pays them three thousand dollars a month for the rest of their lifetime, or at least until the money runs out. That's one way to do it. But some people like to say, "Well, let's let's start it at three thousand dollars a month when we pass away, but let's put an inflation adjustment factor in there." So based on inflation, you know, when we pass away, that first year they'll get three thousand dollars a month. Based on inflation, maybe the next year they'll get. $3,100 a month or whatever that inflation adjustment factor may cause it to be so that that person's monthly amount goes up a little bit over time to, to factor in inflation. And then there's a third way to leave somebody $3,000 a month. It's you know because um, the parents may be 60 years old right now and they may not pass away for 30 years. So another way to do it is to say, I leave that child's inheritance in a trust. I want them to get $3,000 a month, but I want that $3,000 a month adjusted for inflation from right now, from the date we signed our will or trust, so that if we pass away in 30 years, that monthly distribution will, will be significantly more than $3,000 a month because it was factored on inflation based on $3,000 at the time the estate planning documents were set up. So maybe when the parents pass away 30 years later, maybe it's $6,000 a month and it will continue to creep up based on that inflation adjustment factor. So bottom line there, there's a few different ways to leave somebody X dollars per month. Now, the factors that perhaps go into your decision over whether to leave things outright or in trust include the age of the beneficiary. If you're leaving things to somebody who's seven years old, that should go in a trust. If you're leaving things to a mature 45-year-old who's shown a long history of of managing money well, that could go outright. And again, if it goes outright, it can go outright, outright, or 
in their own inheritance trust with them as the trustee to pr further protect it from potential divorces. So age of beneficiary is a factor. The financial maturity of the beneficiary, if somebody, you know, if uh, I've heard parents say, you know what, if I leave my son a nickel, he'll spend a quarter. So the financial maturity of the beneficiary is also a way to, a factor in determining whether you leave something outright or in trust. The, the marital status of the beneficiary, not only are they married or are they single, but I've had a lot of people say, Paul, we, we, uh, we, you know, we, we love our son, but his wife, you know, uh, she exerts a lot of influence over and she spends a lot of money. And so um, sometimes that triggers people into leaving things into a, into an inheritance trust to keep those assets from being commingled because some parents say we, you know, we've heard some things about our, our child's marriage. We don't know if it'll last. We hope it does. We like our daughter-in-law or we like our son-in-law, but Paul, you just never know. I don't know how many parents have said when they talk about wanting to protect the inheritance for their children's from their children's divorces, they've told me the old Paul, we like our daughter-in-law, but you just never know. So let's make sure we have those protections in place. How much debt a child has is a, if, a ch if a child is up to their ears in debt or maybe even higher, perhaps leaving things in trust for them, maybe for their lifetime. But by leaving things in a trust, you can have those spendthrift provisions in place so creditors can't seize the child's interest in their trust like they could seize it if a child received an inheritance outright. Also, if a child is or if a potential heir or beneficiary is getting certain government benefits and their receipt of an inheritance would uh, reduce or eliminate those government benefits, that's always a reason to leave things in trust. Um, sometimes children with special needs who are getting certain government benefits because of their disabilities, things can be left to what is commonly referred to as a special needs trust to supplement those benefits that they're getting from the government instead of leaving it in a trust where it replaces those benefits and could um, eliminate or reduce their government benefits that they were getting. We talked earlier about, you know, if a child or beneficiary has had alcohol or substance abuse issues, you never know, there could be a relapse. So leaving their inheritance in a trust, naming a trustee, maybe even providing that that trust lasts for the lifetime of that beneficiary or or putting it at the trustee discretion so that trustee can keep an eye on that beneficiary, making sure they're clean, making good decisions before that trust terminates and the principles distributed to them. Another kind of on a side note, many, many couples, many, many parents, many, many people who um, were in the process of making these decisions to leave people in inheritance and making the decision of whether to leave it outright to them versus leaving it in trust for them. Sometimes um, the fact that they don't have a trustee that they could name it to, to put in that position of trustee leads them down, down a path of having no choice but to leave it outright. So I've seen some parents struggle through that decision. Yes, we really think we ought to leave Robert's $1 million or one third of our estate in a trust because we're not sure whether Robert would handle it just right. So so they say, you know, may, maybe a trust would be the right thing. That way it would be doled out over time. He could benefit from it for the rest of his lifetime. We know he'd always have a place to live. We know he's all, he'd always have a vehicle. We know he could get his education if he wanted to. But sometimes people say, we got nobody. We don't want his siblings to be the trustee. We don't want to put them in that position. We've got no other family that we could name or at least feel comfortable being a trustee. And sometimes they'll go on to say, we don't want to use the corporate trustee route. We just don't like incurring all of those corporate trustee expenses after we pass away. Um, so, uh, or maybe they're saying, you know, that the, the amount that we're leaving this beneficiary is it's not enough to justify having a corporate trustee and their corporate trustee fees. The corporate trustee may not even accept this trust as a, a client or customer because it doesn't meet their minimum thresholds of, of investments that they need to have in order to serve as trustee. So, but sometimes people struggle and they're like, you know what, we got nobody. Let's just Let's just leave it to Robert outright. We'll be gone. You know, Robert's old enough now where he should do the right thing 
about, uh, with it. We'll talk to Robert about it, but we got nobody who could be the trustee. Let's leave it to Robert. It's kind of unfortunate when that happens, but sometimes you see people who they're just uh, more comfortable leaving it outright than, than they are kind of uh, having to select a trustee when they feel like they have no one in place to be able to um, uh, serve in that position. All right, so number four, last thing I want to do of the four before I go to the chat and the questions and comments, if any, is let's address a quick case study. All right, and, and I want to show you how different kinds of trusts are used in a really typical married couple with children scenario. So in our case study, we've got a married couple. Oh, let's say they have $4 million of assets. It could be 400,000. It could be 40 million. Let's settle on 4 million because 4 million is easily divisible by two. You've got a married couple. So here's the, here's, and that couple is getting their estate planning done. They've, they've got some children, they've got some grandchildren. So let's talk about how they'll use trusts instead of leaving things to outright. So the first decision they make is how do we leave things to each other? And, and maybe the wife kind of points out, she knows, she says, you know, uh, we, we have 4 million together and the wife says, my husband's got 2 million and I've got 2 million. And maybe the wife says, if I die first, my husband's going to have his 2 million and I don't want to leave my 2 million just to him. Because if I just leave my 2 million outright to my husband, he'll have the entire 4 million. And, and who knows, he may be influenced by somebody into making a bad decision later in his life and he may disinherit the children. So I don't want that to happen. So what the wife says and the husband agrees to is when one of them dies, that deceased spouse's share goes into a trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. So now the wife dies, husband still has his 2 million. The wife's 2 million is in a trust for the benefit of the husband. Perhaps he can even take distributions out of that for his health, education, maintenance, and support. But when the husband later dies, the wife's 2 million or what's left of it must revert back to her children the surviving spouse doesn't have the right to change where the deceased spouse, the deceased spouse's portion goes after the surviving spouse passes away. So that's trust number one. Then they said, okay, after both of us pass away, yep, we're fortunate. We have $4 million uh, in our estate. We have three children. We've got five grandchildren. So we don't want to leave it all to our three children. We want to make sure that our grandchildren can get a head start in life. So when we both pass away, Tell you what she says. Let's leave. Let's leave um, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to each of our grandchildren. Our grandchildren are minors. One was just born a year ago. Another one is three, five, four. So they leave. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, what did I say? Let's say two hundred thousand dollars in trust for each of our grandchildren. They have five grandchildren, but they're minors. So what they decide to do, they leave those bequests to grandchildren. In trust, they name the parent of the grandchild, who was also the grandparent's child. They name the grand the parent of the grandchild as the trustee. So the parent after the after grandma and grandpa die, a um, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars goes into a, a trust for each of the grandchild. The grandchild's parent is the trustee, typically it would say that the trustee has the discretion to use the assets for the grandchild's health, education, maintenance, and support. And then the grandparents said, well, uh, assuming they get through college, they'll probably be 22 or 23. Let's let them have what's left out of their share, a third when they're 25, a half of what's left when they're 30, the rest at 35. So, so that's some trust for the grandchildren that the grandparents set up. And now, so so the grandparents are now saying, okay, when we pass away, we have four million now. We'll probably have more when we both pass away. Let's leave two hundred thousand dollars to each of our five children. That's a million dollars. The rest can go to our three children. However, we have a child who has had some substance abuse problems in the past, and and the parents or grandparents in this case also say we're we're okay with leaving each of our children the same amount, but we're also okay with taking this one child's portion and leaving it, leaving it in a trust so they're not the trustee and they don't control it. They've had some substance abuse problems. Let's name this other pe person or these other people as the trustee of that child's trust, have it doled out over time, make sure he's good, making good decisions before it gets turned over to him. 
The other two, two children, we'll just leave it into their inheritance trust so that way it'll always be protected for the rest of their lifetime in case they get divorced. They won't commingle their trust assets with other assets they have with their spouse. So now we're talking about various reasons and various different kinds of trusts being used. Of course, the married couple had their joint revocable living trust just to get started to avoid all the probate. So four or five different kinds of trusts really for the typical modern day married couple with kids and grandkids situation. All right. So before we go over to the chat and address some good questions, um, I want to sum it up by saying um, out this outright versus overtime slash in trust. Number one, if the if the kids are adults, mature, financially responsible, and you're comfortable saying when we pass away, let them have it. There's no need to put any restrictions on them. Then you're going to go to the outright um, down the outright path for them. And it's again, either outright, outright, or it's in their inheritance trust where they are the trustee. You're not putting any restrictions on them, but you're leaving it in a trust for them. So it's less life likely to get mixed up with other marital assets they have less likely that they'll lose any of it if they get divorced. However, if you'll go down the over time or in trust path, if uh, either due to their age, maturity level, any number of reasons, you're just not comfortable with, with dumping it into their laps. And when you, when you do set things up to, for them to get it over time, that trustee decision is very important. The when can distributions from the trust be made becomes very important. And when the trust terminates and the principal does get distributed to the beneficiary, all those are very important provisions of the trust. All right. That being said, let's hop up and go through some of the chat. If you got some questions, now's your time. Uh, I've got a dinner date with my family in a few minutes, so I'm going to jump right to it. So um, Rico's mom says, thank you. You're very easy to understand. Well, thank you, Rico's mom. And um, I bet Rico is a great guy because you know how to compliment people. Freestyle says, hello, all. Which one works best with the Medicaid look back of five years and avoids probate if possible? Really what we talked about here is we talked about from, uh, for example, if you have a married couple, all this whole presentation was about what happens when somebody dies and they're leaving assets. Now what you're talking about, and you can review a live stream I gave a week ago, it's up on the YouTube channel. What you're talking about is leaving things to a very particular kind of irrevocable trust where you have no access to the principal ever during your lifetime and you transfer your assets to that trust at least five years before you go into a nursing home. Yes, those trust assets do avoid probate when you pass away. And once the five year passes after the stuff, after you set up the trust and transferred assets to it, those assets are so-called protected under the Medicaid eligibility rules. Go check out my TikTok channel, I guess is what it's called, because we did a lot of Medicaid discussions and uh, we had posts with thousands of comments about the, you know, is it right to do that? Is it appropriate? Is it legal? Is it, is it ethical? So some good stuff there. Susie Showtime. Hi, I'm glad to catch a live. Likewise, glad you caught it too. Uh, Susie has a question. There are issues in regards to some members getting more than others. Well, sort of. What was suggested to my mother was to split everything among us three children then, and I think maybe you ran out of space, take the portion from the two children to give them with children from the two with children to give them a portion of their children. Is this a bad idea? I think what you're getting at, I may be wrong and you can correct me, Susie. When, uh, if you're going to leave things to grandchildren, you've got a decision to make. So let's say, you know, one child has three children and another child has no children. So, um, you want each child, each grandchild of the three grandchildren to get $200,000 a piece. So do you leave those funds, the $200,000 to the three grandchild from one child? Do you leave it to them off the top? And then the children split what's left. The child who doesn't have any children is going to say, well, that doesn't sound fair because his family is getting a lot more, more than me because I don't have any children. Or do you say that the child who has three children and those grandchildren who each get $200,000, $600,000 total that $600,000 is taken out of the child's share. So each family gets an equal amount. There is no right or wrong. That's a decision for the grandparents to make, for example. 
And it's just a personal decision that you have to make. But I would think that it would be important not only if you do something like that to not only do it, but to communicate uh, very clearly the, the why you're doing what you're doing. So uh, again, that's, that's just an estate planning rule in general. Don't just do stuff, but do stuff. And if appropriate, especially if the stuff is unique, communicate not only what you did, but why you did it. And that sometimes can avoid conflict or hard feelings on the back end. And once the, once the pass away, how the trustees put it in their name. Okay, so if John and Jane have the John and Jane Doe Revocable Living Trust, they have a brokerage account with a million dollars in it. And their trust says when John and Jane both die, Robert as the trustee um, is to transfer those assets half to the Robert Inheritance Trust, half to the Sally Inheritance Trust. Well, when John and Jane both die, then Robert as the successor trustee of the John and Jane Doe Trust gets John's death certificate and Jane's death certificate and a copy of the trust instrument, which says that Robert is the successor trustee of the John and Jane Doe Trust. And Robert gets that information to the brokerage firm where their brokerage account is being held. They'll look at it. They'll see that Robert is the successor trustee. They'll see through the death certificates that John and Jane have both died. And they will allow Robert to then transfer those assets out of the John and Jane Doe Trust to the appropriate beneficiaries, whoever that may be. I hope that gives you your answer there. So, and then there's a different, you know, way for, for how real estate gets handled. That successor trustee, if, if John and Jane leave the house to Sally, then, and Robert's the successor trustee of the John and Jane Doe Trust, then the day after John and Jane Doe die, um, Robert signs the paperwork transferring the house out of the John and Jane Doe Trust and into Sally's name. That transfer gets recorded in the real estate records everybody's good. And again, all that's done outside of probate when it's done through the John and Jane Doe Revocable Living Trust. All right. Um, so what he's saying is a great one. Good. Susie, good to get the good feedback. Dana uh, says hello from Alaska. Been uh, been working with a couple from Alaska here in the last couple of days. And if they're like people in Alaska, Alaska's got some great people. So um, yeah, just part of our national law firm of helping people around the country, check out our website or request a meeting in the description below. Click the link. And sorry, one, the person under special needs passed, how the trustee put the property in their name. Not really sure what you're getting at here. Wish I knew a little more and would want to ask some more questions, which I had some more time. Freestyle, this is assuming that the person did not stay in the nursing home long term and eat away at the inheritance. Nursing homes can easily cost $150,000 a year or more. Good point. Susie, but can you actually control that beyond the initial time of the estate? Mm, still not sure what you're asking. They they can take that to court and contest it if I suppose right. Monday, a couple of days ago, I did a, a, a one of these on on no contest clauses. My my, my thing here, and, you know, and Susie, I'm gonna maybe pick on you a little bit. Not really. You're like, well, can't they take somebody to court and contest it? Um, so yeah, here in America, people can kind of sue, but to successfully sue, you have to bring lawsuits with merit. So nobody can just contest something and say, no, I, I realize my parents left everything to their three kids, but I'm contesting. I want all of it. That will never be successful. So um, I always don't like to see that comment, but anybody can contest it, right? Well, you have to, to do it with merit in order to successfully contest things. Anyway, Harris Dunn put in trust when there is an issue and then years pass. More good good stuff from Susie. Um, let's see. Hello, Bradley. Oh, is there a way to protect your annuities, Roth IRA and pension from Medicaid so the adult children's kind of a state by state issue, but um, you can't get your IRA. Uh, uh, did we ask about IRA? We didn't. Certainly can't protect a pension. A pension, you can't get a pension. That's a monthly payment that you get for your lifetime. You can't get that out of your name. If you go into a nursing home, you've got to use your income. So there's really no way to really protect a pension. There are some particular rules where if a married couple, one spouse in the nursing home, but this, this isn't a Medicaid long-term care, Medicaid eligibility live stream presentation. That's for another presentation. You're welcome, Pam. Thank you for your comments. King Otis Club, do beneficiaries need to sign off before the trust is terminated? Well, first thing you, you have to do when you ask any question about any trust is look to the terms of the trust instrument and see what that requires. The, the terms in the trust instrument really control 
what everybody's rights and obligations are. So that's where I'd go first. You're welcome, Sunkissed Earth from Virginia. Uh, Dana says, do we need to update old trust to common law now? Again, all depends on the circumstances. You're welcome. Check out the previous post. Unborn grandchildren. Yep, you uh, you perhaps you don't have grandchildren born now, but maybe you do when you pass away. Certainly, you can provide now for those unborn grandchildren who might be born when you pass away. Hi, Paul. Can I put business assets in my trust? You sure can. Uh, very common to put business assets into a trust, uh, certainly for probate avoidance purposes so that business doesn't get tied up in probate. You've got some more there, but I'm kind of in a hurry. Jennifer, I have an only child and and, and I want him to get it all. Very, I'm on Medicaid and ill. So again, we'd have to talk about that where the tax transfers from one trust to another. Typically very little. When, when parents die and there's no estate tax because they died in 2024 and the married couple can exempt $27.2 million from tax. All that goes into trust for the kids free of tax. Income from the trust gets taxed to the beneficiary or to the trust, but principal distributions from the trust to the principal beneficiary generally are not subject to income tax because generally speaking, they're receiving their inheritance and an inheritance is generally free of income tax unless you inherit an IRA where you'll have to pay income tax on distributions from your inherited IRA. A lot there. And I think that might be what Matthew was referring to. LD, uh, Larry, very useful. Good. I'm glad you came, Larry. Always good to see Larry on there. Any books for general education on trust probate issues? I would say my videos. I've got 700 videos on YouTube. You're already on YouTube right here. Uh, take a look at that first. That might be easier, a great place to start. Dad committed suicide and my only child can't fill, find his will. What do I do? Well, the general rule, if you can't find somebody's will, even though they didn't do this, it's presumed that they destroyed it with the in intent to revoke it. If you are an only child, you'd probably be inheriting everything under the intestate rules that would apply in your state. So um, there's some issues there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Y'all have a great night. I'm going to dinner. I'm late. We'll see you next time. Check. Uh, we got two, uh, two more YouTube live streams over the next couple of days. See you later.